Welcome to uh, the technical deep dive on the asset tracking solution for Postanel. With me today is Selchuk Sasoglu. Welcome, Selchuk. Uh, he is the lead software engineer for the IoT platform. Yeah, thanks for having me, Amer. And I'm really excited today to talk about our architecture. And let me show you how it goes. Okay. Um, you can see in the screen right now that um, our high level architecture of the IoT platform, uh, and we selected some components for our audience, which we think would be interesting if they try to make a solution like ours. Um, IoT platform, as you can see from the services that we have selected, tries to adopt the serverless architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and IoT platform is an event-driven system that can process thousands of messages per second. Oh, that's awesome. Could you tell me a little bit about where the data comes from? So what's the, what are some of the data sources that you use for the, for the platform? Yes, definitely. As Enrico and Sander men mentioned earlier, uh, we're currently implementing an asset tracking solution. And currently, we are uh, tracking our roll cages. Mm -hmm. The roll cages have a beacon on them. Each one of them is attached a beacon, which sends out their sensor data uh, uh, every three, once every three, four seconds. Oh, OK. Uh, but this is not enough because the beacons by themselves do not directly connect to our backend. There is something we call a gateway in between, which detects the beacons around them. And when we combine the, combine the advertisement that's coming from the beacon and the data on the gateway, we get back a detection in our backend. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Aselchuk. So could you tell me a little bit about how you process those detections that you get from the beacons? In order to be able to tell you how we process the data, I need to go into a little bit detail about our gateways. As you can see from our architecture diagram, for simplicity, we just put two types of gateways here for you. Uh, one of the type is mobile gateways, and the other type is fixed gateways. Both of these gateway types um, have the capability of uh, uh, edge computing, so we can do some filtering uh, and smart stuff on the edge, uh, but also um, they have different capabilities. The mobile gateways that we have are really good at sending us the telemetry and sensor data from the beacons. But the fixed uh, gateway type cannot process the telemetry data, but they're really good at telling us where an asset is. They are really accurate on location. Uh, and as you can see, different type of data coming from different type of gateways, we have to combine them together and uh, make our data as reliable as possible. And this is how, uh, and how we do it is uh, uh, we, we process them per gateway type and then put them into a raw data stream that we have. So that's very interesting. What could you tell me about the raw data stream? What do you do with the raw data stream afterwards? Yeah, as I said, different type of data is flowing from different kind of inlets, right? We try to transform that data and, uh, and then we flow all of these raw detections into a kinesis stream that we have in our architecture. And raw data stream is, I think, where the fun begins, because over there, you can really see the scale of our platform. Uh, on an average day, you see around 4,000 messages per second on that stream. And it can go up to 6,000 on a, a busy day, um, especially during the night, because most of our sorting and other operations are happening during the night. Uh, and raw data stream holds all of these information. And it's just pure raw detection. And that's where the name is coming from. Uh, and we also have the capability of storing all, those, all these raw detections somewhere, uh, because we think that it's going to be valuable in the future, where we can uh, leverage some machine learning algorithms to detect what's going on in the raw detections and how can we filter them out in a more smart way. From raw data stream, our data flows into something we call Truthening. Uh, truthening is actually is not a word, but we made it up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and in truthening, what we do is um, we filter out all of the raw detections that are not accurate enough or um, where the sensor data will we think it is corrupt. Uh, and we so it's it's an attempt to make our data as reliable as possible before we aggregate it. OK, that sounds great. But what uh, do you do? Why do you need to uh, aggregate that data? Why, why is that? Yeah, as I told you, in the raw data stream, if you don't aggregate your data, we have overwhelming high traffic uh, on our stream. And we cannot, we cannot uh, forward those kind of events to our integrating partners, because then their workloads will also be get overwhelmed, right? And we 
as IoT platform, what we target the most is to make our data as reliable as possible. So in order to be able to do that, we actually run some aggregation uh, functions over the detections that we have. When, and then we try to look into the data in a certain time window and we partition the data according to the beacons that we have. And after we have the aggregation, then we start actually uh, sending these detections to our internal event producers where they will create the business events that are valuable for our integrating uh, partners. So after truthening, we have something called geofencing. This is where we use the location service of uh, AWS. And uh, over there, we have our um, geofences defined. Um, uh, and when a certain asset goes into a, a sorting center uh, or comes out of it, then we get notified with, uh, with, that e with an event. And this event is really valuable for, uh, for the business. We have also other types of internal uh, event producers. One of them is called the availability service. Uh, as you might ev imagine, um, mm, the beacons themselves are not being connected to our backend, right? I said that there are ga gateways in between, but if you don't have any gateways around, it means that your beacons are sending advertisements, but nobody is picking it up. So we also want to get notified when these kind of things happen. If you don't hear from a beacon for a long time, then we create an event out of it, say that this beacon or this asset is not available anymore, we cannot reach it. And this happens a lot actually in PostNL because the role cages we are tracking, we sometimes leave them into a, a, in a customer location. And customers don't have the infrastructure that PostNL owns, then we cannot detect those real assets anymore. Um, other than availability, we have uh, something called asset history. And as you can see from the uh, architecture diagram, the data also flows into this uh, module as well. Asset history is something that we created for ourselves because um, if we write down the detections from a certain beacon or a certain asset, uh, then we can actually bring up a map and then plot the road of that asset on the map and see what's happening on the field. Uh, uh, and this is really good when you want to uh, connect the physical world to the digital world, and you can really assess if your processes are going right. To find the, the, uh, the, the logistic network that you try to achieve, is it really happening uh, on, on, on practice? Then you can see it. Um, other than asset history, we have also something called asset state. This is something we use internally because uh, we want to know the latest situation of the assets. Uh, this, is, this, this module, we try to use it for debugging purposes and just to, um, to be able to see if the, uh, if the um, system is working right. We write the latest status of each asset and then we can query this module and see what's happening uh, right now. Can you tell me? Uh, we, we can answer questions like uh, um, how many assets in Amsterdam? And um, yeah, um, and th th this is also some kind of information we expose to our integrating partners, um, and we want to validate with them if that is really the case. Um, after we produce these kind of internal events, we also send them out to our integrating partners, and that's happening in the outlets uh, that you see in the architecture diagram. Outlets are, uh, we try to keep them really simple, it reads the events that the internal event producers uh, create, um, and then it transforms it to a certain contract that we made with the integrating partner, and then we send it out uh, through event bridge again. Uh, and that there, there's a cross account rule over there that executes, and then they receive the events that we're generating. Thanks for sharing that, Selchuk. So before you mentioned uh, serverless and how serverless architectures help you, could you explain a bit more about that? How did it help you? Yes, uh, sure. Um, with the serverless, we need the flexibility and the elasticity uh, of, of uh, the system because um, there are certain times during the day that we get a higher load of traffic in our system. And in these kind of times, uh, we would like the system to scale up and then down when, uh, when the load is, uh, is not there anymore. Uh, but there's also something called a peak season for us that starts around November and it lasts until end of uh, February. 
and during this time, actually, the system will work, uh, uh, will have a higher traffic load than usual, and we still need that flexibility uh, during that period. And even if we don't have the high traffic, there are, there could be some business requirements that requires us to go into higher positional accuracy. As we said during the truthening module, um, we're actually aggregating data for some period of time to make it more reliable. But if the business requires us to track an asset in a higher accuracy, we can also do that. With the, uh, with the serverless architecture, we, can, we are in control of our scale. We can, uh, we can uh, have a higher positional accuracy for some time and, and track an asset really accurately if, if that is the need by the uh, business. Uh, but there, there is also a trade-off, of course. If we try to do that, it means that the costs will go higher because we have to operate on a more number of detections. The, the traffic will be higher. Okay, awesome. Uh, could you tell me about like the next iteration? So what are you looking at next? What's the next step? Yeah, the first architecture that we have shown you right now, uh, we started with a really simple question. We tried to answer uh, how many assets are in uh, a certain sorting center in a given time. And from this point on, uh, that was our minimum viable product. And from there, we built the platform uh, to answer that question, and then we started evolving. And in the next iteration, we will continue evolving as well. What I have described with the module-based development sounds a lot like microservices, right? And, and there are some parts that you can apply this term in our platform because they are really individually working. We can deploy them individually. They scale up and down individually. But there are some parts in the IoT platform that you cannot apply this term. So what, what we will work on in the next iteration is that how can we get closer to microservices? Other than that, um, since we are currently uh, implementing an asset tracking solution, we know that this is an implementation of IoT, but it's not what IoT only can do. We can do a, a lot more than that. We can, uh, we can use other types of sensors on the field. And that's what we want to do next. In the next uh, uh, iteration of this platform, and you will see it on the screen, um, we will start adding more types of telemetry. Uh, uh, and the current beacons we have already have some kind of capability around temperature, the battery levels, uh, and we will start processing this kind of data already. But it's not limited to that. By adding different kinds of sensors on the field, the platform is capable of uh, processing that kind of data as well. And this is our target in the next iteration. Could you tell me a little bit about the challenges that you faced through this uh, through this process? Because you have this new architecture that you're working on. Could you tell me a little bit about the challenges? Yes, definitely. Uh, right now, we're deploying our infrastructure with AWS CDK, and we're really happy with it. But when we first started the IoT platform, CDK was just gaining traction. And uh, in the beginning, we were using uh, CloudFormation to deploy our infrastructure. So. Somewhere in between, we had to migrate from cloud formation to CDK because uh, of the advantages of CDK, actually. Uh, uh, but that meant that at certain points, uh, we had to write some custom resources to uh, achieve the things that we were achieving with cloud formation so that we can do the same with the CDK. That part was a challenge for us, but uh, we are right now complete with the migration, and it went uh, really smoothly. Um, the next challenge that we had was uh, cost optimization. Uh, and this is something that AWS Well Architected Framework also uh, mentions all the time. Uh, because of our scale, the costs are always a problem. As I said, our system can uh, scale up to 6,000 messages per second. And if you try to process that kind of information, your, uh, your costs can go really high. So we have to be really careful about it. One of the examples that I can give you is uh, when we started to use location service. In the beginning, we were... Um, we were connecting the truthening module directly to the location service, where after we aggregate the data, we were pouring all the reliable detections to location service to see if the assets have moved or not. And as you can imagine, on a normal day, this would mean like around 60,000 messages that we are sending to location service, and uh, the cost of that would be really high. So what we did, again, uh, this is one of the moments where the module-based development uh, shined because we just put a module in between that sits between the truthening and the location service, uh, geofencing service, um, 
and that does an internal caching for us. So then we started for first um, examining the data that the detections that are coming out of truthening and then we were doing some basic calculations like, okay, did, did, asset, did this asset move enough that I should do a new geofencing around it? Uh, uh, so by answering this simple question, we actually dropped 99% of the cost uh, by just placing a, a, an a, a internal module in between uh, that does this caching for us. So we, ha we have a few examples like that that we had to solve and these are all happening because of our scale actually. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, that's really a nice result to drop 99% in, in cost. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about, so if you would do this again, right? Uh, what would you do differently? Definitely we would start with AWS CDK right off the bat uh, because we noticed it along the way uh, and we migrated our infrastructure to CDK, but uh, CDK gives us the uh, uh, availability to write our infrastructure in a programming language that we are comfortable with. And you would do the same from the start, actually. Mm. And are there things that you would do the same? So some, some things that maybe worked and you would do the same again? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I have a good answer for that as well. Um, um, so embracing change in our profession is really important. Uh, so and we evolved our architecture from day one. And that's definitely the thing that we would do again uh, when we start this from scratch. Yeah, so if there are other people that are looking to do something similar, right? What are some, what are some tips or advices that you would give to someone that, uh, that's starting off? Depending on the scale, I think the first question that needs to be asked, um, do you need to stream the data or can you get, use the cloud queues like uh, SQS and SNS? This is, I think, an important decision point because it is difficult to go back and uh, fix, uh, fix it uh, if you cannot decide it properly in the beginning. Um, the, the next thing is, yeah, definitely if you haven't tried, give AWS CDK a try. And uh, uh, it really uh, uh, heavy lifts a lot of infrastructure deployments for you and it can handle really complex deployments, uh, especially in our case. Um, other than that, um, yeah, cost optimizations or cost estimations should be a part of the process all the time because uh, if you don't do it, you might end up with some surprises when you deploy to production. And uh, definitely look at the AWS well-architected uh, framework uh, and try to see what kind of uh, um, know-how you can get from there uh, because uh, it's really valuable. Selchuk, thanks a lot for your advices. I think a lot of uh, people in the audience will, uh, will benefit from that. And to the audience, of course, thank you for watching this uh, video. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I want to give you the last word, Selchuk. Are there any things that you wanted to add? Yes, thanks. Um, Postenel is growing its engineering capability and it's growing really fast. So what we have talked today, if it is interesting for you, definitely check out the vacancies we have from Postenel website. Thanks a lot, Selchuk. Thanks.